Welcome to this lecture session on grinding principle and application. Grinding can be considered as a multi point cutting operation very similar to any machining operation. In this case, abrasive grids in large number suitably bonded with a binding agent and in the form of a wheel actually does the function of a grinding. Here we can see these grids which are the abrasive particles bonded in this cementing medium and it is removing the work material in the form of fine layers in the step by step mode. So, this wheel is imparted with certain velocity and at the same time the work piece also moved or advanced towards the grid and as a result of that we have the cutting action. So, these are the two examples of grinding where the material is being removed from the surface, it is a surface grinding and this is also another example of surface grinding involving small wheel. Now, if we look to the basic objective of machining, on one side we like to have material removal rate and on the other side the machining accuracy. So, there are various processes which can give material removal rate or machining accuracy. Now, so far as grinding is concerned, we have different types of application of grinding. According to that old concept, if we go back to this diagram, we can see that the basic purpose according to this concept is to achieve machining accuracy, good finish which are not achievable by just ordinary machining by some cutting tool and there grinding has to be used. And also there are cases where the work material is extremely hard and it is not possible for the single point cutting tool to have the cutting action on this hardened material or inherently hard material. So, in those cases grinding is the only option, but according to the new concept what we can see here that it should be possible to have high stock removal in just single pass. Conventional grinding needs multi pass operation, but what people like to achieve a single pass operation thus transforming grinding to a abrasive machining or what we can call abrasive milling. Then the second objective according to this recent concept is to also to extend this abrasive milling not only to hardened material, but also to unhardened and ductile material. That means, these abrasive wheels should encompass both hardened material and soft ductile material. Then the third one which is also very, very important high stock material removal under lubricant free environment. So, the according to this new concept the grinding operation or the process which ca can be elevated to abrasive machining, it is supposed to fulfill these two application or these two purposes. How do we characterize this grinding? How does it differ from conventional machining? Number one, what can be immediately recognized? Very high velocity of this grinding wheel compared to any cutting tool which is being used for usual machining application. Then 
Another thing which is also immediately can be recognized variation in the geometry, basic geometry of these cutting points, which are nothing but those abrasive grains. These are working like the multi point cutting tools. That means this is not fixed. When, whereas in any, any cutting tool, this is well defined. So, there is also random orientation of the grips giving unknown tool geometry or rake angle. And as we have already mentioned, it needs high velocity, that means strain rate is also high, specific energy is also high, which leads to high grinding temperature gradient. So, these are in summary the basic characteristics of this grinding or abrasive machining. Now, let us have a closer look how this grinding wheel is actually functioning. This is the wheel configuration where each grit is serving like a cutting tool and this is imparted with a velocity. That means, the main cutting velocity here we have the fit velocity V w. Now, if we look here, if we consider this particular grit, immediately we can see it is engaged in chief formation. So, the number one interaction is the grit workpiece interaction. Actually, it is the interaction between the wheel and the workpiece, but we can split up the bulk interaction into individual interaction. So, the number one is grit workpiece interaction leading to formation of the chip. Then we can see further to this chip bond interaction. This chip is rubbing over this bond material, which is just the cementing agent for holding this grit. Number three, what we can see that this chip which is going to be a pretty long chip and we have a limited space. So, it will immediately fold back and it will start rubbing over this workpiece and that we call cheap workpiece interaction. We have the fourth one too. If the bond level is high, then this bond also can directly engage in rubbing over this workpiece, which is very, very undesirable, but as placed we can see such kind of thing cannot be avoided. The fifth one, which also comes with this one grit workpiece interaction, like cheap grit interaction, it is very similar to the chip in a machining say for turning. The chip is actually sliding over the rake surface and it is very similar to what we say in the number fifth one, cheap grit interaction. Now, with all these five interactions, ultimately the grinding action can be continued over this entire workpiece and as a result, we have certain amount of material removal, we get the exact dimension required finish through this removal of chip, but individually this can be splitted into five interactions. Now, obviously, during this grinding, we have to spend energy. There will be generation of force, there will be generation of temperature, there will be certain level of specific energy. Now, what should be our strategy? If we can look into five interaction, immediately one can recognize the very importance of the interaction number one, that means the grit work interaction. And this interaction actually causes removal of the chip. That means, this is the most useful interaction leading to chip formation. Now, what about the rest four? This rest four are all undesirable interaction which also require energy and also force will develop. So, according to that strategy, the best option will be to enhance this number one. That means, we should 
choose or create a condition in order that we can maximize this grid workpiece interaction and minimize all this remaining four, two to four, five, all these things should be minimized so that we can have the best possible utilization of the energy available for this grinding action. Now, if we look further to this, if we concentrate our attention to this great work interaction resulting in formation of the chip, at least in this great action which can be subdivided into three. Number one is rubbing. This can be promoted by the basic geometry of the grid as we have already mentioned that this grid geometry is not properly defined or controlled. There could be an unfortunate eventuality that grid has only sliding action. Then we have also ploughing. What is mean by ploughing? It forms a group, it cuts a group, but this groove is cut without any removal of the material. We can see immediately from this diagram that this material is pushed laterally and a groove is formed, but this chip, this material is not removed in the form of chip. Now, so far as grinding is concerned, these two are undesirable interaction inside this grit and chip interaction. Now, what is most desirable? This third one, the removal of chip by shearing. If I consider all these three, then by the shear mode, we really have the material removal and proper utilization of the energy and perhaps we need much less energy for removal of the material through this grinding process. But anyway, we can say that the grit has to pass through these three stages. Number one is sliding followed by ploughing and ultimately shearing. It is the efficiency of the grit and those conditions that determines whether the grit is actually engaged in major part of its action for shearing or ploughing or sliding and that will decide how much will be the level of force, what will be the level of rise of temperature, what will be the requirement of specific energy. We can have a look into this basic grid geometry. In this basic grid geometry, we can see here a positive break, a positive break and also we can see another grid with a negative break. Obviously, this positive break is most desirable, which can reduce chip reduction coefficient, thickness of the chip after grinding, less deformation, less energy spent and also low rise of temperature. So, that means this is most favored, but in grinding we cannot control the basic geometry of the grids, which is random in nature. So, we have no option, but also to accept this one, but with the clear understanding here rise of force temperature will be quite high compared to what we can see here. Now, we like to also have our attention to this grinding zone, just it cannot be ignored. What is very, very different, which makes this grinding different from the cutting action of a single point tool. Here actually, chip is engaged in, the grit is engaged in chip formation, which we can see. This grit is actually creating this chip to this cutting action. Now, where this chip should go? This chip cannot leave this place. It is confined. Where it is confined? Between these two grits the one, the grit which has already done some grinding, the one which is presently engaged, then you have bond material on this top and the workpiece, this contact area. That means, the cheap material which is being continuously produced, that is confined here and the skill 
how with what ease the chip can be accommodated within this storage volume available before it the, the grid comes here and the chip is thrown out. That will decide also the performance of the grinding wheel. What we mean to say here that it is just not the strength of the grid, its thermal stability or hot hardness or its sharpness or the favorable rate geometry. It also to be considered the cheap storage with what ease the chip can be stored within this space before the grit comes out of this contact zone and this chip is thrown out. That will also determine the uh, final outcome or the ultimate performance of the grinding wheel. We can have the best possible bond or the best possible grit, but because of this shortage of space, this wheel can also have premature withdrawal or premature loss of life. Now, this is one important graph showing the need of very high cutting velocity in case of grinding. If we look how this grinding is conducted, one can immediately recognize the very importance of high speed. This speed we normally do not use in case of cutting or machining. Why it is so? To illustrate this point, we can have a look here. If we have a look, cutting force versus cutting velocity, this is a normal trend of cutting force versus cutting velocity. That means, the force comes down with increase of cutting velocity. So, that is one point in favor of cutting velocity. Now, we have two curve. One, this one shows for a tool with positive brake angle and the upper one with negative brake. Now, for one cutting speed, we can see the tool with negative brake generates high cutting force. Now, what happens? In case of grinding, we have just now seen that most of the grids can have negative grid geometry. That means, very, very odd situation. Now, to neutralize, to offset this um, odd situation to our advantage or to our favor, what we have to do? We have to increase the cutting velocity, so that even with this negative break, we can reduce the cutting force to our advantage. And to achieve that one, we have to go for excessively high speed. And at the same time, we can also see that the effect of positive break or negative break that narrows as we increase the speed. So, if we consider these two points for the same level of cutting force, if we choose one grid with a positive break, we can work with this velocity. But if we have another grid with a high negative break angle, we have no option but to go for a higher cutting speed, so that we can keep the force level at the same magnitude. So, this is one reason why we should always opt for high velocity in case of grinding. Now, we have another thing, cutting velocity has another role also. It is just not reduction of the cutting force, offsetting this um, disadvantage to our advantage by augmenting the velocity, but also another thing as we have seen that this is the chip produced during grinding. Now, the chip, the grit starts its action and it leaves here, the grinding action is terminated here. Now, during this movement from this starting point to the end, chip has to, the grit has to go through three phases sliding, ploughing and ultimately shearing. What is our desire that grit should start shearing 
from the very beginning of grinding. And this particular curve shows at least we need a certain level of grit penetration to have this shearing. What we can see here that the velocity versus critical depth of cut. What is mean by critical depth of cut? It is a requirement, requirement from grinding. That means, if we like to have just shearing with a sharp point, there will not be any flare up of the material. It is like a cutting a sharp V group. Now, on this side, what we see? We see a V group, but also we have material piled up through this lateral displacement. The material is physically displaced on the two sides and it is an best example of ploughing. That means, material is being pushed on two sides while making this group. Now, what we can see that the requirement of critical depth of cut that becomes lesser and lesser as we go to higher velocity. For example, if this is our chosen velocity, then if I reach this point, that point corresponds to this is the minimum depth of grit, grit penetration that is necessary to have such groove cut. That means, to have this shearing action, we need minimum this grit depth of cut. If we have something less than this, we end up with such situation, we cannot avoid this material piled up on this. If we like to have critical depth of cut still less, suppose here, then we have to reach to this graph and find out that velocity has to be augmented. So, from this diagram showing a correlation between cutting velocity and critical depth of cut, we can immediately see that the critical depth of cut can be reduced, requirement can be reduced by simply augmenting the cutting velocity. Actually, what happens here? The inner mechanism is like this. We know a hardened, in a hardened material, penetration is will be easier, there will be less ploughing action. So, immediately the grid goes, immediately goes into the shearing mode. So, the sliding and the ploughing will be less compared to the shearing action of the grid. So, hardness of the workpiece definitely playing an important role in deciding what is the requirement. So, what we are doing here, what is done just by increasing the speed we get some improvement in the dynamic hardness. It, we can call it a dynamic hardness, which can be induced during the high speed operation, as if the wheel gives some impact with that high velocity and thereby its penetration becomes easier. It goes straight to the shearing action without spending much of its time for sliding or ploughing. We can see immediately the effect of grid depth of cut versus force on this rubbing, ploughing and shearing. Here it is grid depth of cut. Now, as we have already discussed, rubbing, ploughing is the initial stage that occurs and there for little increase in grid depth of cut, the force is disproportionately high we can see little increase in depth of cut and we have large increase of the force. But when it goes to the shear mode, we can see that force is not increase of force is not that high with the increase of grid depth of cut. So, this shows that why the specific energy or force will be quite high. Specific force or specific energy, why it should be high? when we work with a lower grid depth of cut. This is another illustration, which also shows that during grinding, the situation may also change. Now, how this change may take place? Let us have a look here. 
that originally this was the shape of the grid and this gamma 1 that shows the original rake angle which is of course quite negative and it has a high negative value. This is understandable considering the configuration of the grid, but the problem may be compounded. How? If we have unfortunately some material piled up which was originally in the form of chip and it adheres or stick to this grid. Now we can see if we consider this tangent and this normal line, then we can see that gamma 1 now it has become to gamma 2 and the value of gamma 2 is quite high. It is obvious that this is higher compared to this one. That means through this sticking, this effective rake angle has increased and this increase is uh, has taken place in a negative sense. That means such kind of grit is expected to increase the force. So, augment of the force which is not at all favorable, not at all desirable, it happens because of the undesirable change in the grit geometry during grinding because of this material built up at the tip of the grid. There are certain materials where such situation we may have to come across. So, we are going into another aspect of grinding as we have mentioned that it is just not grit action on the work material leading to chip formation. It is also how the chip can be accommodated within this chip storage space. If we look into these two grips, then we have this bond material and this is the border of the workpiece. So, this is actually the available chip storage space. This chip storage space will provide the necessary storehouse for accommodating this chip. Now, here two things are very, very important. The uncut chip thickness, this is the uncut chip thickness which starts with 0 and assume the highest value when the grit is about to leave the workpiece. Now, this is one thing which is equated by this relation and here the table speed, wheel speed, the grit spacing, wheel depth of cut and the wheel diameter they are playing their role and we can immediately see the role of this VC. If we redu increase this VC quite high, then we can reduce the value of AM and immediately the load on each grit can be reduced substantially and that helps in improving the performance of the individual grit. There is another parameter length of the undeformed chip, which actually is a function, direct function of the wheel depth of cut and diameter of the wheel. If we increase either of these three two, then this contact length will increase and the length of the uncut chip will also increase. So, these are the two parameters important, uh, which should be considered during grinding. Now, here the volume of the chip to be considered, because this volume of chip removed by grit, each grit that has to be accommodated into that chip storage space. And this volume with some simplification, we can equate, correlate by this half into chip maximum chip thickness into this length of the undeformed chip. Here we have two possibilities, either we have a grid like a, which looks like a pyramidal section or a grid which has like a chisel edge, both can have such geometry and accordingly the shape of the chip may little differ, but more or less we can consider this as the chip volume to be handled by the chip storage space.
Now, here we are coming, we are considering one very important aspect of grinding, the cheap accommodation problem in grinding and that sometimes it has an overriding influence in determining the performance of grinding compared to the quality of the grit or the quality of the bond. Now, we can draw one analogy of this cheap accommodation of the grinding with that of a broaching tool. It is a very good analogy. Suppose this is a broaching tool and each cutting edge or the tooth is participating in removing successive layer as illustrated in this figure. Now, this is the length of the work and as each this edge is yet to start action and it has just completed action and the rest three are in their intermediate position. If we see this particular tooth, here we can see this is the available space. Now, this length cannot be accommodated just in a very simple manner. This chip has to fold back and this folding back will take place like a coiled spring with some radius and it is with what is the chip can be accommodated that decide that force. It is just not the force arising out of the chip formation, but also chip uh, force is arising out of all other interaction. That means, if this chip is little constrained or compressed or squeezed, then the total force may increase and exactly that happens in case of grinding. If we look here, that this are the grit material, we have this chip volume, storage volume, which is used for storing this chip. Now, here this grit has just completed the grinding action. This one is in, in it is in, in intermediate position and the third one is yet to start. So, this yellow color shows the volume of the chip which is to be removed. Now, during its path, its movement from this point to this one, this volume has to be accommodated here. So, at least what we can say, this volume should be equal or greater than this volume of the chip. So, while designing this wheel, one has to consider the chip storage space considering the volume of the material being removed by each grid and which is a function of this thickness of the uncut layer and this contact length which has been illustrated here. So, this is one of the constraint. So, this is the equation we can see that if we consider the cheap protrusion and width of each grit, then the volume of storage space available per unit time is equal to is given by this expression. And what is the material removal rate per minute that is equal to the table speed into the depth of cut into the width of cut. So, from this we arrive at this relation which is given by V w by V c into d. And so, the crystal protrusion which is one of the component which gives this chip storage space, this should be at least greater than this value. Now, we go to the second constraints. What is that? Chip thickness constraint that means, chip thickness should not be such that it is going to interfere with the bond. In simple term, the chip thickness should not be more than the crystal protrusion. If we consider this, then definitely an equation can be framed which is given by the volume of the chip removed by individual grit. Then we have to also find out how many crystals are participating in this chip removal per unit time. This can be simply determined by dividing the velocity 
grinding velocity by the grid spacing. So, this is the number of crystals which are participating in grinding action per unit time. So, this is the left hand side of the equation which can be equated by this material removal rate which is given which is a function of the table speed, the wheel depth of cut and the width of the cut. And from there we arrive at that this A m is equal to this. Now, putting this value here, we can find out that this T should be as we have already said that the crystal protrusion must be greater than this A m. So, that there will not be any interference of this uh, uncut layer with the bond material. So, at least this crystal protrusion should be greater than this magnitude which is given by this expression. Now, we go to the last constraint which is chip length constraint. It is obvious that the entire length of the chip after deformation should be accommodated in the intergrid spacing. Now, here if L is the I mean length of the undeformed chip, then it will be little shortened after deformation and which can be obtained by this expression where this rho is the chip reduction coefficient. So, it is obvious that grid spacing should be greater than this length of the chip after deformation. If this is not the case, then the chip will have chip have to this uh, chip material has to fold back like a coiled spring which has been just illustrated in case of broaching. And then if stage may come, there will be too much of squeezing which may lead to escalation of the total grinding force. So, this is the condition. So, after considering all these three constraints, one can be able to design the wheel spacing and grid protrusion and only then the grid are expected to do their grinding action in the best possible way. Now, this is one very, very important curve so far as grinding is concerned. We can immediately see that specific energy that is an index of grinding capability. So, this is the value or a figure which decides how good is the grinding or it is unfavorable situation. So, it is the amount of energy re required for removal of unit volume of the material. We see that at the very beginning since the grinding grit starts with rubbing and plowing as it starts removing the material, this value is quite high. Now, as it goes to the shear zone, then we have lessening, lowering of this specific energy. So, by increasing the material removal rate, we can reduce the specific energy. But this is only one aspect of this consideration, but we can see also that if we go for increase of material removal rate without other consideration, then also we may end up with steep rise of increase of specific energy. Now, what is the reason? This part comes from the geometry of the crystal, basic geometry of the crystal, its penetratability into the workpiece, then the ductility of the material, loop stiffness of the grinding system, all these things decide the rubbing stage, plowing stage and ultimately shearing stage. But once it reached a saturated value, if we go for further material removal rate, we may reach a stage where this material cannot be accommodated by the given available chip space and that also can lead to cheap accommodation problem which is simply translated into specific energy rise. So, we should try to avoid to go to this side 
if we like to remove or increase it at all, then redesign of the wheel is necessary. Actually, this is a diagram which shows how this rake angle can change the direction of the force, the resultant force and how we can apportion the normal force and the sliding force. If we see a positive rake, then the sliding force is quite high compared to the normal force. Now it is a zero rake, now we have gone to a negative rake angle, this is the negative rake angle we have increased the negative break angle further. Now, if we consider this particular split up of force, this is the tangential force and this is the normal force. Similarly, we can also split up normal force and tangential force. We can see the ratio of normal force to tangential force is quite high in this case. This is a peculiarity in grinding that means normally usually we know a high strain material, a hardened material because of its elevated shear strength is supposed to give larger cutting force and larger thrust force. Both should be high compared to a ductile material that means same material when hardened, its yield point is elevated and because of that, the cutting force or the thrust component of the force should go up, should rise. That is understandable, but that is not what we can see in this case and that is called the peculiarity of grinding. If I consider just this side of this diagram, this is up grinding, down grinding, just if we consider this side, we can see the tangential force, this is the level of force in case of mild steel. It is a soft material and this is a hardened steel. For mild steel, what we can see, the tangential force is higher compared to an hardened steel, whereas the normal force, the thrust force, that, that means the resistance to penetration that is quite high compared in case of hardened steel compared to mild steel. This is understandable because hardened material offers stiff resistance to penetration, but what about the tangential force? Actually this can be explained this term, the grinding means sliding, plowing and cutting, but in case of turning it is, it starts with shearing. So, the energy required for plow sliding and plowing, this component of the force will be higher in case of mild steel, but maybe shearing component will be less for mild steel compared to the hardened steel. So, if we consider the tangential force which is actually composed of this energy force required for sliding and plowing and then cutting, if we add all three then the total summation becomes higher in this case. But if we consider shearing alone, perhaps this hardened steel because of this elevated shear strain should offer higher, should develop higher cutting force. So, this what is we call the peculiarity in case of grinding. Now, we go to some case studies concerning grinding action by some CBN wheel on cast iron, then bearing steel and high speed steel. What we have shown here, this is actually cumulative in feed. Here we have the normal force and the spindle power and this is actually the down feed. If we increase the down feed, that means the depth of cut, force will simply increase. But over this period of grinding, the force is almost steady. Similar is the case with a bearing steel, but when it is high speed steel, what we see that this high speed steel gradually causes gradual or progressive increase of force. 
the spindle power also follows the same trend. This is because of the gradual wear on this grinding wheel and as a result that causes change in grit geometry and force is progressively rising. In this case, the material characteristics does not cause any appreciable change on the grid geometry. That is why over a long stretch of grinding, this force or the spindle power that remains constant. In case of high speed steel, there are certain hard carbides like tungsten carbide, vanadium carbide and chromium carbide that causes wear on the CBN grit and that is responsible for this change in grid geometry and progressive rise of the force. One thing we can look here that spindle power is quite high compared to that what we can see in case of cast iron. This is one thing one can notice. There are two reasons. One can be the basic strength of these two materials. This material bearing steel has a higher yield strength compared to cast iron. Obviously, if we consider a particular in feed or down feed value, there will be some difference. But when you go, go to the highest in feed value about 40 micron, there is a large difference. Now, this difference is not just because of this difference in strength and the force requirement. We have another reason and this reason comes from the cheap accommodation problem. If we look into the types of chip produced during cutting of cast iron and this unhardened bearing steel, immediately we get the answer. This is a low mag high magnification photo, 50 micron and this is just 1 millimeter. One can immediately recognize the size of the chip. This is a quite long chip and this was a face grinding with a cup wheel. So, over that contact length, a large volume of chip can be produced whose length is quite high compared to this. Now, this chip volume has to be accommodated over the chip accommodation space which has been already illustrated in the earlier section of this lecture in the diagram. And it is obvious that the difficulty will arise in accommodating this large volume of the chip which is like a ribbon. If it is fragmented, accommodation is easier. What I mean to say, if we have a given volume, then cheap accommodation is easier with a short chip or fragmented chip than with a long ribbon like chip and that is actually translated into this high rise of this spindle power. Now, we consider two wheels. The difference is here that one wheel is made with larger grid size which gives larger grid protrusion and wide spacing, the another with smaller grid size, small grid protrusion and smaller grid spacing which is illustrated here. So, these are the two wheels, the size it is 250 micron and it is about 126 micron. So, these are the two grids which were used to prepare to single layer wheel and these two wheels were engaged in grinding. Now, this is the performance curve of these two wheels. The wheel type A means which has large crystal protrusion and large spacing. Now, it is actually the ceramic material which was ground under dry condition. Two parameters were noted, the normal force in Newton and spindle power, spindle power in watt. So, these are the two things which have been noted here 
and what we can see that there is a progressive rise of these two force and the spindle power, but the rise is taking place at a higher rate with a smaller wheel, with a small grain size compared to the large grain. Now we let us go to the performance of the wheel in case of cast iron. In case of cast iron, what we see that the force is almost steady with this large grit and there is very little rise of force with a small grit size which is in contrast to just what we have seen here that ceramic tool gives a high rise of force compared to cast iron. And to get an explanation for this, we have to actually look into the basic wear mechanism of the grit. These are the actually type of chips which are produced for cast iron, although they are fragmented chip, but there was they were heavily deformed. And compared to the ceramic chip, which is almost like grit, it is a gritty material fragmented, it is mostly by fracture, but here it is deformation and then fracture. So, these are the two basic difference in mechanism of their chip formation and that also makes a difference in the performance of the wheel. Now, in case of cast iron, we can see that these crystals, the photo shows the crystal structure after grinding. We can see multifaceted appearance, it is typical of micro fracturing of the grit, but when it is the case of ceramic, the morphology is quite different compared to what we can see here. It is almost like a polished surface, that means the ceramic material while being ground causes also abrasion, heavy abrasion over this diamond surface making it a flat and this wear flat grew gradually over a period of grinding and grid geometry was continuously changing. As a result, the gradual rise of force with passage of grinding was inevitable. But in case of cast iron because of large force, this large force actually caused the micro fracturing of the grit and that micro fracturing also maintained the cutting capability of the grit throughout the grinding span and as a result the grinding performance and grinding force was more or less stable and that gives a steady performance over this period of time. So, definitely here the friability of the material that comes into, comes into play and it has a major role to play. Now, we go to the, con to a, to an illustration what can happen if we do not provide adequate chip space. This is one example where this crystal has a very high level of protrusion, but it is a highly dense packed. So, what happens during grinding of unhardened material, this chip actually got entrapped, the length could not be accommodated. That means, it is not that protrusion will serve the purpose. Along with the protrusion, we have to also provide a reasonable grid space to allow, allow easy movement of that long chip and this is what we can understand from this illustration. So, this is one example how this grinding force may change with cutting velocity. At higher velocity, we have less, lesser grinding force and also transverse roughness, this is almost independent of the velocity. This is grinding force versus the table speed. Here we can see as we increase the table speed, 
there is progressive rise of the grinding force, but the table speed does not affect the transverse roughness. We go to this next illustration which shows variation of this in feet or down feet and the grinding force. Here also the force is progressively increased, but surface roughness is not that affected by this depth of cut. This is already has been explained that hardened material gives larger normal force, whereas unhardened material gives larger tangential force. This is actually the grinding ratio which is also very, very important if we consider the performance of the grinding wheel. Actually what happens, this is the volume of wheel wear and that is the cumulative material removal rate. Now when we consider the material removal rate by the ratio, that high ratio means better performance of the wheel and obviously that ratio has to be improved if we like to improve the performance of the wheel. Now wheel wear, wheel wear actually cause, caused by three mechanism. This is attritious wear that means dulling of the surface which can be because of mechanical reason that means if the work material is extremely hard, it can cause mechanical abrasion causing some blunting of the grip. If it is chemical action of the work material against the grit material, even a soft material can cause flattening on the grit surface just by through some chemical reaction. We have also wear by fracture. Because of the grinding force, the wheel grit may also undergo some fracture and this fracture may take place in the micro level or it can take place in the macro level depending upon the friability of the grinding wheel and also the level of the grinding force. The last one is the bulk loss of the material, it is grit pull out. If the grinding force is too high or the bond between the grit and the binding agent is very poor, then loss of grit also can take place. So wheel wear is controlled by this three mechanism. Now we go to the question answer, why high velocity is preferred for grinding? This high velocity is preferred for grinding for two reasons. One, to offset the effect of this negative break. There if we can go for grinding, we can, if we go for uh, high negative, high speed, we can offset this negative break. Another one that chip section can be also reduced by this high velocity. Specific energy should reduce with increase of material removal rate, but then it can increase because of the chip accommodation problem also. For identical wheel condition, aluminum oxide wheel has blunted grit or less sharp grit and that is why compared to CBN it is expected to give, give good finish. And when it is high speed steel, then this hardened constituents of the work material can cause greater wear on the aluminum oxide because it is less hard than CBN. Thank you for your attention.